A single race in 1829 changed the world when Stevenson's rocket shattered the limits of steam. Travel between cities collapsed from days to mere hours, but behind the triumph of those steam giants lay fierce rivalry, radical inventions, and the birth of a global obsession with speed. What secret forces drove trains from thundering iron to silent lightning, and how did this relentless pursuit reshape our entire civilization? The true journey of rail innovation starts with one audacious leap, if you know where to look. In October 1829, a crowd gathered along a stretch of track outside Liverpool, watching as five locomotives faced off in the Rainhill Trials. The prize was a contract to power the world's first intercity railway. Among the contenders, rockets stood out, not for wild promises, but for a new kind of reliability. Rocket's heart was a multi-tube boiler packed with 25 copper tubes that squeezed every bit of heat from the fire. Instead of a single flue, steam now raced through a maze of pipes, reaching pressures and speeds that left older engines behind. Exhaust steam shot up the chimney through a blast pipe, pulling in fresh air and turning the firebox into a furnace, while angled cylinders drove the front wheels with a steadiness that kept the train on track even at full speed. Rival engines broke down or sputtered through the trials, but Rocket ran lap after lap, hauling three times its own weight at over 24 miles per hour. Judges, armed with stopwatches and ledgers, recorded each run. The press called it a marvel. For the first time, a locomotive did not merely move, it ran to a timetable. Workers wrote in diaries of the heat, the roar, and the pride in taming a machine that could shrink the distance between cities to a single day's journey. Passengers would soon board carriages pulled by rocket, feeling the ground blur beneath them as their world suddenly grew smaller. The blueprint was set, a new age of steam had begun, and the race for speed was only getting started. By the late 1930s, steam power had reached its most refined and ambitious form. On the drawing boards at the London and Northeastern Railway, a team led by Sir Nigel Gressley chased not just speed, but the perfect marriage of form and function. Their answer was the A4 Pacific, a locomotive sheathed in smooth wind tunnel tested casing, its lines swept back like a racing yacht. Every inch of the mallard, eesh, the most famous of the class was shaped for the air, from the riveted shrouds to the sharply pointed nose. Beneath the surface, Gresley's engineers fitted a double Kylechap blast pipe and a three-cylinder drive, coaxing more power from every stroke and pushing exhaust through twin chimneys for maximum draft. On July 3, 1938, Mallard thundered down Stoke Bank, its dynamometer car recording a climb past 120 then 125 miles per hour. For a brief, heart-stopping moment, the needle touched 126, the fastest any steam locomotive has ever traveled. The crew fought heat and vibration, with the middle cylinder running dangerously hot, but Mallard held together. Newspapers splashed the record across their front pages, and newsreels captured the streamlined giant gliding across the English countryside, a symbol of modernity and national pride. Posters and magazine covers transformed Mallard into an icon, her polished metal and blue livery promising a future powered by speed and style. Yet even as crowds cheered and engineers celebrated, the world was changing. The age of steam was nearing its limit. Diesel and electric rivals waited in the wings, ready to redefine what a locomotive could be. A diesel engine sits at the heart of the new locomotive, driving a generator that produces electricity for powerful traction motors on every axle. This chain from diesel prime mover to generator to traction motors delivers smooth, reliable force straight to the rails, with no need for water stops or coal shoveling. The Electromotive Division of General Motors, known as EMD, pushed this architecture onto main lines by sending FT demonstrator sets across the country in the late 1930s, letting railroad bosses see for themselves how a crew of two could run a train that once took five or more. Early models like the EMDFT and Alco's RS1 
replace the fireman's shovel with a throttle and a bank of switches, their control stands humming with electricity instead of steam. For the men who ran them, the change was both relief and loss. One veteran who spent years firing steam engines described the first diesel cab as eerily quiet. No firebox glow, no ash in the air, just the steady thrum of the prime mover. Maintenance crews watched as roundhouses emptied and water towers fell out of use. Union halls filled with anger and worry. The brotherhood of locomotive firemen and enginemen fought to keep jobs, but the numbers were stark. By the late 1950s, railroad employment in the U.S. had dropped by half, with dieselization as the main driver. Behind the scenes, manufacturers lobbied hard, offering generous financing, parts deals, and even government-backed incentives. Internal memos and congressional records show how procurement politics shaped the pace of adoption, as railroads weighed the promise of lower costs and longer running hours against the uproar from their own workforce. The mechanical era, built on steam and sweat, gave way to a new order powered by oil and electricity, setting the stage for an even cleaner leap ahead. Electric wires stretch above the rails, humming with silent promise. In cities like Paris and Tokyo, the arrival of overhead catenary systems brought a different rhythm to the tracks. Power now flowed not from a roaring engine, but from a web of high-voltage lines, feeding current through pantographs pressed tight against the wire. With each spark, trains accelerated almost instantly, no gears to shift, no time lost to the old rituals of steam or diesel. Substations spaced every few dozen kilometers kept the voltage steady, while auto transformers along the line balanced the load, allowing trains to run back to back at intervals that would have been impossible before. A planner in Tokyo, flipping through ridership charts, saw the change firsthand. Where steam once meant gaps of half an hour or more, electric trains now arrived every two minutes at rush hour, threading through dense neighborhoods and carrying millions each day. Regenerative braking turned every stop into a chance to feed energy back into the grid, trimming both costs and emissions. On the busiest commuter lines, recovered electricity from braking powered the next wave of departures, saving up to one-third of total traction energy. Stations swelled with life as neighborhoods thrived around the new convenience. The network itself became the engine, reliable, frequent, and nearly silent, reshaping how cities grew and how people moved. The era of the locomotive gave way to the era of the system, laying the groundwork for the world's first true high-speed corridors. Steel rails stretched from Tokyo to Osaka in 1964, carrying the world's first high-speed trains at a pace that seemed impossible only a decade earlier. Hideo Shima, chief engineer of the Shinkansen, insisted that speed and safety could go hand in hand. His team shaped the train's nose to slice through air, sealed the cabins against sudden tunnel pressure, and designed articulated carriages that moved as a single, flexible body. The Shinkansen ran at 130 miles per hour, carrying thousands each day with a record of reliability that stunned even its critics. In France, engineers behind the TGV pushed further, coupling cars with shared bogies for stability at 186 miles per hour. Their streamlined duckbill noses tamed pressure waves in tunnels, while digital signaling kept trains safely spaced at high speeds. Germany's ICE added modular safety systems after the Eschede disaster in 1998, prioritizing passenger protection above all else. China's planners took these lessons to scale, building over 40,000 kilometers of high-speed lines, more than the rest of the world combined, linking cities in every climate with trains that rarely miss a minute. Levitation begins with force and precision. In Japan, engineers at JR Central built the L0 series around superconducting magnets, cooled to near absolute zero, creating magnetic fields strong enough to lift a train 10 centimeters above its guideway. No wheels touch the track. In April 2015, the L0 broke through every previous limit, reaching 603 kilometers per hour on a test run near Mount Fuji, a record that still stands. 
the achievement was technical and personal. The project lead, a veteran of Shinkansen development, described the first full-speed run as both terrifying and beautiful, with the sensation of floating at highway speed. But each breakthrough carries a price. The planned Tokyo to Nagoya line runs mostly underground, and its tunnels and guideway have pushed costs beyond $50 billion. Every kilometer demands millimeter tolerances. In China, planners weigh Maglev's promise for urban commutes against the realities of land acquisition, grid demand, and public debate. Maglev's frictionless glide offers speed and silence, yet the trade-offs in cost, energy, and land linger raising questions about how far and for whom the next generation of rail should run. High-speed rail now links 35,000 kilometers of track in China alone, reshaping how nations compete and connect. As cities grow and climate pressures mount, the next leap in rail isn't just about speed, it's about survival. The race to innovate continues, and our future rides on its rails.